Hello, I'm Len Cardin, Chair of the Arlington School Committee. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, October 24th, 2019. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey is not with us tonight. Uh, and uh, we don't have a teacher rep. So. Oh, sorry, AEA rep, Jason <laughs> Levy. Right. Uh, is right there. Hello, we, don't Mr. A, we, don't have, we don't have our high school rep tonight. Mm -hmm. All right, so first item on the agenda is public comment. We have one person signed up, uh, Lynn Kosterman, Kosterman, if you could come up to the table so people at home can hear you and you can have up to three minutes to speak. Mm -hmm, that's okay. um, hello, everyone. My name is Lynn Klosterman, um, resident of Arlington for over 30 years. Two kids out of three went through the school system here, so I've been around for a little bit. Tonight, I wanted to ask about getting on the agenda at some point, possibly in discussion of uh, MIAA sanctioned sport called Alpine Ski Racing. Um, Arlington, that's the only MIAA sanctioned sport that they don't have currently. Um, and so we've been, my daughter is a junior here at the high school. We've been um, trying to form a club team. We have actually for the last two years. Um, the first year we had nine kids. Last year we had 12 kids. Uh, it was a mix of boys and girls. Um, so I have a lot I could say, but I know I have three minutes. So my husband prepared something for me to read. So I'll just go through this really quickly because he actually con consolidated everything nicely here. Um, okay. So I'm here to open the discussion on a proposal to add alpine or downhill ski racing as a varsity sport at the high school. The school principal and athletic director encouraged us to petition the school committee to see if the school budget could be amended to include funding for the sport. Um, we have talked in the past to Melissa and to Stanley last year and also obviously Dr. Janger a number of times on this um, I represent a community of families that have been organizing successfully running the club alpine ski racing team for the past, he said two, three years, but it's really just the last two years. As a result of these efforts, over 20 AHS students have been competing for the past two years as a team in a club run out of Blue Hills. So we were able to get a slot at Blue Hills and they were gracious enough. Belmont stepped out of that slot, so it opened it up. Um, Belmont ended up going to a Neshoba slot. Um, unlike other club sports at the high school, because downhill and cross-country skiing are officially sanctioned MIAA sports, the only com competition opportunities for skiing are in the MIAA leagues. Ski East, down at Blue Hills, has graciously allowed the Arlington team to compete in order to get traction, but because we are not an official AHS varsity team, Arlington faces some restrictions that, such as not being eligible for end of season state tournament race, ski racing. We did have two kids qualify last year for the states. They couldn't go to them because we're not a sanctioned MIAA varsity sport. We have met with the past athletic directors and the principal of AHS to petition to have skiing considered as a varsity sport. They have been supportive in us continuing as a club team but do not have the budget to add it officially as a varsity team at the high school. They recommended we petition the school committee for consideration to be added to the school offerings. Ski racing has been a high school sport in Massachusetts for over 70 years. It's been an MIAA sport since the formation of MIAA. Nearly all the surrounding towns near Arlington and sharing, sharing similar demographics offer it as an option to their students, including Belmont, Winchester, Lexington, and Waltham. The experience in those towns is that once the team is recognized, this, they quickly fill spots. And it's not atypical for there to be more than 30 or more men and women that join the teams. BC High is in the Blue East League. Um, they have over 100 boys on the team. Notre Dame Academy, they have quite a few girls. Um, I can go through if I have a second on some of the others, but Winchester started their team not that long ago, I think about five or six years ago, and they're up to over 40 kids. It grows every year. Um, the sport itself, while competitive, also enables athletes to virtually, at virtually any ski level to participate, which is true. Of the 12 students last year, only three had prior ski racing experience. We would like to present more formally at an upcoming school committee meeting or subcommittee meeting and are looking forward to the discussion. 
if that's possible. Great, thank you. So we um, <clears throat> don't, you know, we don't act on yeah. uh, public participation. Later in the meeting, there is a opportunity for uh, members to discuss future agenda items. And I did, um, you know, as uh, I said in the email to somebody emailed me about this, um, <clears throat> that Steve, my husband. Steve yeah. okay, that uh, we do have a new athletic director and yes. we are checking with him to make sure that he has a chance to review this before we put it on the agenda. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Should I stay through the end then? To see uh, you, you can watch from home if you want. I mean, it's just going to be uh, somebody's, somebody suggesting that, requesting that it be put on the agenda if they so want to. Uh, it might be referred to a subcommittee, and I'll, we, we'll let you know if it okay. is referred to a subcommittee. I do have a, a PowerPoint if you want additional information right now, or I could email it to you, Len. Uh, probably you email it to Karen. Email it to Karen. Right. She'll get it to us. Yeah. All right. Great. That'd be great. I'll email it to you, Karen. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so we did have our student rep join us, Mr. Moore. Uh, congratulations. I was received notice that you were appointed the permanent rep, so thank you for, for joining us. Um, do you just want to introduce yourself? Uh, and uh, uh, Bill, can you pass your mic down? Sure. I got your name wrong last time, I apologize. So if you could tell me your correct first pronunciation. Uh, my name is Manjot Moore. I'm a, a senior at the Arlington High School and I'm on the student council as a senior class rep. Great, welcome. And uh, if you have any, uh, any, when we were discussing something, if anything you want to chime in, just uh, signal me and I'll, I'll, I'll call on you. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. So next is appointment to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, Ms. Seuss, do you want to? Yes, so um, we continue this great tradition of a tremendous amount of activism and interest in town in joining committees. So every time there's an opening, we get tons of um, applications. Um, this time we got five really qualified applicants and we had a chance to interview each of them and um, we were just very impressed with this one. Um, the committee, what I think, was unanimous and in recommending you and also just being very impressed with your qualifications and your thoughtful response to many of the answers that the questions that we asked and so we would like to uh, recommend or we voted to recommend to the full committee um, her nomination so if you want to come up and introduce yourself you need to speak oh, into the microphone <laughs> yeah. right. we're much friendly and we're not going to have <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. What uh, did the president know and when <laughs> did he know it? <laughs> the team of lawyers, right? Um, my name is Laura Swan and I was a professional engineer in California. I've since been at home with my son in elementary school and uh, I volunteered primarily because I wanted to put these skills to good use for my community. And uh, I mean, that's why I started in civil engineering in the first place. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'd be very excited if you guys nominated me. Great, thank you. Mr. Hainer? I move the appointment. Second. Yes, Mr. Schiffman. I noticed there's, uh, you went to school in Arizona as well? That's correct. So you're very West Coast-ish and big streets and... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, so well, that's I, where I grew up. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine because you're now a hardy parent and you live in East Arlington, the streets and, and, and the whole transportation system is very different. It's, it's wonderful. It's actually one of the reasons we chose uh, to live where we live mm -hmm. is um, we wanted alternatives to simply driving everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I grew up was you drove 45 miles per hour past all your neighbors um, and all the kids got to school on buses and it did not allow for the same opportunities to meet and form a community mm -hmm. if people live that far away and if they don't. Uh, pass each other on the street to say hello. It's one of the things I love about this town. So, so you've you've obviously looked at the uh, patterns at the Hardy, and you know about the signal that's going in. What what else are your thoughts concerning how we can make things better for uh, both the students going to school and, uh, and and for everybody else who has to get around town? Oh goodness, um, that was actually one of my questions for this committee was <clears throat> if you wanted this position to reach out to say PTOs and school councils to see if they have feedback on how their students are getting to school or concerns that maybe even aren't 
maybe making their way up, like they don't know who to talk to at the mm -hmm. city, or if you simply want um, the issues that percolate up to school council to then be taken to the transportation. Well, it, it's sort of an interesting thing because uh, um, uh, my condo association put something before the, uh, the TAC, which just got adopted mm -hmm. by the selectmen. So there's a lot of people sending recommendations and requests, but we do have quite a bit of things that go through that are safe routes to school and school related, and they talk about them a lot. And I, I don't know that you have to go and make a formal alliance to go meet with every one of no, the not PTOs. <laughs> But, but sometimes just um, appearing in a PTO meeting yeah. um, or having a chat with the principal can um, give them the opportunity to know who they need to talk to, mm -hmm. um, who with the city. I know that we have a new uh, principal at our uh, school mm -hmm. party, Ms. Parrots, and she is she's wonderful. And you know, as a new person and as a newcomer to the town, she wasn't quite sure who to talk to about, like the light signal or <coughs> other certain things that affect how students get to school. And so, yeah, I was like, that's a town engineer. Like, you know, that to me that seems obvious because that's my background in engineering. Is you, you go to the town engineer for certain things, you know, oh, this is, would be public works or streets. So um, I'm hoping that maybe putting a face or reaching out to people will it's, proactively. It's a beautiful thing, but yeah. understand, and I'm sure you figured this out from living here for a while, that uh, <coughs> Massachusetts town governments, particularly those with a representative town meeting, operate very differently. In fact, we're extracting a lot of free labor from qualified people on the TAC, which would normally be done by a town engineer. Yeah. So anticipate sitting in a corner watching cars go by. <laughs> I've done that too. Yeah. <laughs> that too. The good old counts. Yeah. Mrs. Thank you. Oh, so um, actually, your question makes me even more excited about having yep. you on tap, oh. I have to say. Um, and I'll tell you how I always see committee roles. I do see them as a liaison between the community and administration or town governance Probably or something too. like that. Um, and I don't think there's any constraints on who you can talk to and who you can gather information from. Mm -hmm. um, I think that makes you a great committee mm -hmm. member as long as you're not you know, rude or disrespectful or you know, you're just know. talking to people and I think that's great. I think I, I definitely encourage that. Um, I have to say that TAC are, is very well respected in town mm -hmm. so that you will find when you reach out to people as a representative of TAC, you, to, you get a lot of respect. Yeah, there's some okay. very good people there. Thank you, that's good to know. Oh. So, oh, go ahead. Go so, ahead. if you would like to talk with the principals, it might be a good idea if we, you and I have a conversation and then we can introduce you to them and figure out what the communication pathway will be. You're, you're having, your, having been in Hardy, you have had a chance to talk to Ms. Peretz, um, but it would be nice for the other principals to be aware of your position mm -hmm. and we could figure that out. That's true because sometimes mm -hmm. schools also have a particular plan or a particular way that they want students to say arrive and mm -hmm. dismiss and sometimes just talking to parents they aren't aware of these things or you know they have their own opinions about um, what they would like to see versus what the school thinks is mm -hmm. the safest or best practice. So. Great, thanks. So I actually got my start on the Transportation Advisory Committee. That was my first volunteer role in town, uh, well, in, in town meeting at the same time. Um, so it is an interesting bunch. Um, you know, your skills are, are very uh, well, very good for the committee. There definitely are other civil engineers and people who know transportation. So um, I, you know, I do think they have a, a, they're sort of an advisory committee to the Board of Select, uh, the Select Board. So. Um, they do have a mechanism where things have to go to the select board first. You right. can't just bring things up to the TAC. Um, so, so the liaison role is, is important, but um, talk to them before you start going out and seeking, seeking yes, sort of yes, input on transportation kind of question, issues. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely with the Save Routes to School, they've been involved, so that will be helpful as we, we look at other schools. To, we're doing that at Stratton now, um, and we did, it, we did a project at Dallin, uh, but not all of the schools have had that program. So that would be a, definitely a good role for you to, to play. So thank you for stepping up and volunteering. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? It's unanimous. Congratulations and thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. All right, next we have the buffer zone report. 
I'd like to welcome Marilyn Salvis again uh, this year to give us an overview of um, the results of buffer zone decisions this year. And um, I'm going to leave, you know, she can invite me to, to chime in as we do this. Is we, we spend a lot of time uh, in my office um, going through uh, buffer zone decisions. They're not made lightly. They're made very carefully in terms of enrollments in different uh, classrooms at each one of the schools. So I'm sure there's going to be some questions on this, but right now, um, Ms. Salvas, would you like to begin? Sure. Let's see if I can. Okay. Um, this year, we opened up enrollment in January, and we delivered we um, 859 students to power school to the the different schools in all the grades between January and September. So we had um, now a lot of people leave too, and then you have the graduating class. So the enrollment difference. At the beginning of September, and one of the, the things I, I gave you was the um, class size list, which was done for September. And I gave you this year's and last year's. And the class size list is not um, the official numbers that go to the state. It's, you know, the, the schools put the kids in classes, and we count the, the number of kids in each class and report that monthly to um, the central office here. And when we look at last year and this year, the, all of the grades are different, but they're only, the total enrollment is only different by one. So the, the size of the schools, the, the size of the student population did not change a whole lot. Um, <coughs> we, it doesn't make sense. What? It doesn't make sense? I was actually surprised when I looked at it, and I think that when we, if we compared October instead of September, there's probably a difference. That's just not right math, though. It, it, it's about 100. It's 100. It's about 100. 99. Oh, 100. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a typo, unless I... It's 99. Yeah. 99. 5890 versus 5989. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's 99 difference. It's not a lot different. It's not a lot different, but it's not one. Anyway. Okay, we had... Um, 119 of the kids that parents made a buffer zone choice on got their, their first choice, and 30 students got their, last, their, their second choice. Um, everyone that has a sibling already in the school automatically gets put into that school. So we have, when we're looking at making placements, we look at who lives in the, the zone that's not in the buffer, and then immediately we add the siblings, and then everybody else gets a decision made. So 79.8% um, were placed in their first choice this year. Last year, we were closer to 90% getting their for first choice, so it was not um, our, <clears throat> we look at it as a success rate. It did not go up. The slide showing the um, 119 kids getting their first choice is in the, the packet I handed you, but it's not on the screen. 
and you can see that those are all grades and a lot of times there are siblings that come in so we'll get um, more than one kid in a family that's you know, placed in the schools. But um, the slide that shows all the, all the buffer zone placements is nearly impossible to read from up on the screen, which was the reason that I, I gave you the handouts anyway. <clears throat> things that we looked at was if there were how um, big the the classes would be if we didn't use the the buffer zones so the the white is the the actual and the gray is um, if everyone went to the school that they would have gone in before buffer zones <clears throat> and what I just realized that I didn't do is these are in the same order as I didn't put the headers on it so it's you know Bishop Brackett Dallin Hardy you know alphabetically across the top like it is on the um, the class size report so alphabetically from Bishop to Thompson let me add the titles to you and send it to you and we can we can send it out this is something <clears throat> that Kathy asked me to do when I was in the office with her this week and I didn't realize until I looked at it right now that I didn't have the school headers on the top of it. Let me just comment on um, the data that, that is here. I don't know if, it, can you see it up there on the screen? It's not really. Uh, not really. I think one of the more dramatic of the of the kindergarten placements this year was at Bishop. If we had had the, we just had placements on the old district lines, we would have 27 in each class, kindergarten class. By employing the ability through buffer zones to move some students to different um, schools that are part of their buffer zones, we were able to keep the class sizes at 24. When you get this data and you can really look at it, you will see that the effect is somewhat of a little bit of, of a, a tweaking that goes on. Um, and in fact, some class, classes would have been smaller um, if there had not, if we had not moved students into the school. So it, it has gone both directions. Some classes have been made smaller and some larger, <coughs> but the, 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 the goal is to make them more equitable. I will say that um, last year was a little bit more successful. It just, maybe it's just the way students were um, placed last year, how they were distributed in the first place, I really should say, how they were distributed in the first place, lent with some buffer zone decisions to pretty relatively equitable classes. This year that wasn't as much the case. Um, we still we have class sizes at kindergarten that are um, 24, which is just pushing the edges of what we'd like to see. But we also have you know class sizes that are at, at 20. So there is there is a little bit of a range. It's not it's not um, an unacceptable range, but um, there is a range still. 
So the goal is always to maintain as best as possible equitable class sizes um, among, our, among our schools. Now you're having the kindergarten because the, the upper grades is really more of a, a little bit of a tinkering. And for the most part, if we were to say most students that come in up at other grades have probably a higher percentage of placement than they would at kindergarten. A first choice placement. So as we go forward, we use this data as, as to look at whether um, it would be helpful to expand buffer zones, uh, to expand them in certain areas versus others. And that's something that uh, looking at right now, I, I, I'm not prepared to come back with any kind of recommendation yet to the subcommittee, but it is an active it's an active research project going on right now. <clears throat> questions? Ms. Morgan? So um, I have a couple of questions. So I had always been under the impression that we use buffer zones to help equilibrate class sizes or cohort sizes. And so it, I get confused when I see things like, you know, there were um, there were fourth and fifth graders that were in the Bishop Stratton buffer that were placed at Bishop instead of Stratton. And so to me, I don't know why that would happen because you've got 70 fourth graders at Bishop and 64 fourth graders at Stratton plus maybe a couple of SLC kids that are never on this chart. Um, but I don't know why you would put a kid at Bishop in, in if the cohort sizes are much are smaller at Stratton and the same for the fifth grade and then so that confuses me and I see a few of those that happen and the other thing that I think is is tricky to reconcile but I I would like to hear more of the theory behind it is that we shifted a bunch of the bracket Dallin buffer kids into kindergarten at Dallin some of them were probably siblings so they needed to go there um, but we're doing that because this year we have a K-1, which is okay, um, but what happens is by shifting all of those kids in, then you know, we have the situation where in second grade, those kids were part of a K-1 two years ago and there were kids pushed into Dallin to do that, and we've got 73 kids over four sections, which I would say is not ideal, right? Those are, those are kind of small. Like I don't love seeing sections of 17. Uh, I mean, I would love to have a kid in a section of 17, but as a school committee member, that's hard for me. So, I, so my first question is, why are we not using these buffer zones in the upper grades to balance cohorts across different schools? And then what's can, the- Can we go, go one, at time. Yeah. one at a time? So, yeah. The answer is that we do. Sometimes there are some mitigating circumstances, and in those situations, the principals are involved in those discussions, um, and there are good reasons for it, but the answer is yes, we do do that. I think one of the challenges, well, let me see what's your second question, because there is a challenge with the kindergarten placements, the way we're doing it right now, starting so early. Okay. That my, my other question had to do with um, how you're managing the K-1 at Dallin and how that drives the buffer zone placements. Because I can see looking at the K, having a K-1, I can see why you would want to send those five Dallin bracket buffer kids to Dallin, right? Because you have room for them in kindergarten because you've got a K-1 class. But then you create a cohort of 70 that may or may not be able to stay at three classes as they go through. Does that make sense? It does, and okay. we think about that quite a bit, the, the, the principal, Digman, and myself. Um, the, of, of all of the buffer zones, that was the one in which there was reaching back out to parents who did not get their first choice. So that does happen also. People can put on the wait list. One of the challenges of the of early identification of schools back in January, February, is that to, to some extent you, you, 
we look at past, the past what happened, but it's sort of hard to know how it will play out this year. And that is one of the challenges. You know, it, in the ideal world, if you really wanted to maximize it, you wouldn't do any buffer zone placements until, you know, June. But realistically, that is not real for families because they don't want to wait, and I understand that they wouldn't want to wait, for a very practical reason, and that's after school care. So there are built-in constraints and challenges with this, um, and it's at best a, 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 a tweaking of what we have. It does have it. It does make a difference. Can we make? Can we do something better, and have different timelines? To even improve that. Those are all considerations. Just really quickly, just so what what I think you're telling me, and I think it makes a lot of sense, is is that when those kids were sh sent to Dallin instead of to Bracket, right now I'm seeing 70 and I'm saying, oh, that's a little high. But those kids could have been kids 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, at which point we would have been saying, good plan send 60 and 61 and 62 because we don't, you know, then you can have class sizes of 22, 22, 22 across. Right. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's exactly it. It's you make decisions in early on that you can't really have a crystal ball to see what the effect of those decisions are too much later. Any other questions? Mr. Schlickman. So if you get that situation, let's say that we put somebody in school A because the enrollment's low. <coughs> if that was a <coughs> school and all of a sudden the numbers flip, we, we do call people up and say, hey, you're on the wait list for the other school, do you want to go? We do, yeah. and surprisingly, at that point, they say no, mm -hmm. which is most often the case because they've already gone to the school, they may have, because sometimes those conversations happen in the summer, so they've already mm -hmm. met their teachers at that school, yeah. you know, it's, it's, met, met the yeah. Other kids and, you right. Know, yeah, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> just that one observation from me, when, I mean, the, when the buffer zone policy was adopted, one of the concerns was neighborhood cohesion. Mm -hmm. And the numbers I've seen, particularly in the bracket, Bishop Bracket area, um, heightens my concern because it does seem like, It does seem like we're flipping year to year from sending kids over to Bishop or sending them to Bracket. And so, so sort of, instead of having a trend where we're gradually, you know, we, I, th the, I think the original idea was to gradually shift people away from Bracket because that was full. But now it turns out that Bishop is full. So now we're, from year to year, we're flipping back and forth depending on the year. Mm -hmm. um, and that is breaking up the neighborhood cohesion because one year all the kids are being sent to back bracket and next year they're all being sent to Bishop and vice versa. So I, I guess that's another mm -hmm. factor you have to balance. Mm -hmm. But I think as we look at how well they're working and, and whether we want to expand them, um, we just need to think about that idea right. of having every year having the kids go to a different school. Right. And that's actually, and I think you make a very good point on that and, and I'm, agree with you it's a, it's an it's an issue and it actually where it comes down and very practical is when we have students that are in a, an apartment building uh, that have some students going to one school and some to another how do you you break up the walking you know groups to school and I, I think about that very carefully too um, not to, to break up some natural groupings of students uh, you know, parent can't pick them up, they can call their neighbor. It's, those are really important um, things to consider. And so I think that this is something we can have more of a discussion at, perhaps in a, in a subgroup, as we think about this, um, in terms of how we want to move forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you again for the, all the detailed data. <laughs> Thank you. All right, next up. More data. <laughs> MCAS report, Dr. McNeil. Mm -hmm. 
Joining us is uh, Ms. Paula Sullivan, who is our data specialist as well as a math coach at, at Hardy. Has been very much involved for a number of years in, in helping um, both get the data but also get the big picture of what the data means. Okay. Good evening. So I do have here Ms. Paula O'Sullivan, who is our district data coach, and she's also one of our math coaches. So she splits those two responsibilities. Um, I do want to start off by saying uh, there was a question about uh, looking at why certain subgroups or certain uh, groups of students didn't perform at a certain level and getting deeper into the standards and the looking at the item analysis. I will say because of the size of the data points that we're covering tonight, I can come back at another time in order to cover that uh, type of information, but it will not be included in today's report because of <coughs> the, just the enormity of all the information that we're trying to provide you. So that can be... Uh, we can discuss that in a subcommittee. We can come back and discuss it at a full committee. Um, if you just let me know, I, I'll be happy to do that. So the objectives for today's uh, presentation, I am going to look at and try to uh, answer some of the questions that were brought up um, at the last presentation. Uh, we're going to re review the achievement levels again, just what those categories are. Looking at student growth percentiles, um, we're also going to define that again very quickly. And then we're going to share the subgroup results. Uh, at the last presentation, I shared the aggregate for each one of the grade levels across the district. And so now we're going to delve in and disaggregate the data and look at the various racial and ethnic groups, um, gender groups, and as well as students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, EL students, EL and former ELL st EL students. And then we will open it up for questions and comments. So here are some of the questions that were asked at the last uh, presentation. Uh, what are the goals and criteria used to determine accountability levels for schools? Why did the state incorporate a new accountability system? And was there an increase in the percentage of 10th grade students failing the ELA and math next generation MCAS when compared to the, M the legacy MCAS? So in the first slide, you'll see that these are some of the goals of the new accountability system. And I just want to highlight bullet number three, that it was um, one of the things that I think that is it, they've done very well <clears throat> is that now we're looking at the cohort of the lowest performing students the lowest 25%, and uh, we're forced to do that. And I think that's a good thing because we want to see the achievement gap between our highest performing students and our lowest performing students, notwithstanding their subgroup status. And then you can read uh, what some of those other goals are. Then I wanted to look at some of the just, I didn't define what those indicators are. And as we look at our accountability status, so for the accountability indicators for non-high schools, you look at the achievement, the student growth, the English proficient, language proficiency, and, and additional indicators, which include chronic absenteeism, um, and that's defined up there as well. So these, are, these categories are looked at at the students as an aggregate and in the lowest performing group. So when you look at the accountability report, You'll see it's divided between two columns. On one column, you'll have the uh, points that you achieve for uh, achieving some of those targets they set for each one of those uh, categories, those indicators on one side, and then the other side, they will have it for the lowest performing students. And that's how you uh, acquire your points. And this is the weighting of those various indicators. 
You'll see achievement is 60%, and you'll see how it um, is distinguished. So if you do have an EL population of students, it'll be one uh, column or one percentage. And then if you don't have an EL population of students, which is determined by the student's performance on the access test, all EL students take the access test, and then you'll, they'll get a, a level, and then they'll determine how those students are moving towards English proficiency. So you'll see how the weighting is adjusted if you do have an EL subgroup of students and if you don't. And you have to have at least 20 students in that particular category uh, in that subgroup in order, to be, or in order to be counted as an EL subgroup. Excuse me, is that 20 physical or 20%? <clears throat> I'm sorry, 20, like, 20 students. yes. Yes, 20 students, yes. And so this is, um, these are the accountability, accountability, ugh, accountability indicators for high schools. And this is for all schools in Massachusetts. So you have the achievement, student growth, high school completion rate, the uh, EL proficiency status, and the additional indicators. Um, and you'll see how that's defined in that category. And then you'll see the weighting for the high schools. And again, the same thing stands as you look at the EL and uh, uh, subgroup. So a question was asked when comparing our warning and failing or not meeting uh, for ELA and math, uh, and when comparing the 10th grade students, the performance of the 10th grade students on the legacy when compared to their performance on the next generation, uh, because last year was the first year that our 10th graders took the online math or ELA and math MCAS, which is the next generation. So you'll see that the, um, you'll see, be able to compare the, the, the percentage of students who are, uh, who achieved warning or failing. And if you look up there, you'll see in 2017 and 2018 was the legacy MCAS. And then in 2019 was the next generation. And so we performed pretty much the same. And we actually distanced ourselves from the state. As you see, that there was an increase in, in the percentage of students on the ELA that um, received the not meeting status. And then looking at it for math, um, you'll see where there was a slight increase, um, but the the distance between us and the state has remained the same. So, however, we still want to look at that and make sure that we get that down to zero. So these are the next generation achievement levels. I just want to review them again as we get into subgroup. So you have exceeding, meeting, partially meeting, and not meeting. And then the student growth percentile. So we're going to review data for the achievement and the student growth percentile. So we're not gonna go through every slide in detail. However, I am just going to point out an overview as we look at the achievement um, slides uh, and what pretty much remained constant from every slide is that, you know, depending on the grade level and the subgroup that they, that in the majority of the time we outperform the state. Uh, but when you look at the racial and ethnic groups, you'll see that there's a disparity between the performance, especially with our African American and Hispanic and Latinx, <coughs> Latinx, uh, Latinx students. Uh, you'll see that there's a, a big discrepancy as you compare uh, their performance to the all of the students subgroup. So that's something that we uh, need to look at. And then another thing that I noticed as I looked at the various grades is we see our female students uh, in ELA outperforming our males. And I was talking to a colleague of mine and I was thinking about the racial and gender makeup of our teaching population and, and it's you know, largely white female. So I don't know if that has an impact on our female students saying you know, that's a positive impact on them so they're able to uh, achieve at a higher rate. Yes. So what I see for the third grade, and this, the graphic that I need to understand this, and I might just need to like draw it myself, is so it, our, our um, meeting and exceeding for all students in third grade jumped from 68 to 73% this year, 
yes. Yes. Which is you... not in like that's a that's a bit significant increase. Did our did our um, did our subgroups rise? Did rising tides lift all boats or no? So did our achievement gap? I guess what my question is: Did the did the gap grow this year because um, the all students group did better than they did last year? Do you see what I'm saying? Like I don't. I guess what I don't see is mm -hmm. the sum of the subgroups: the 34 and the 41 and the 39 and the 48 and the 55. Those five subgroups. How did that achievement gap for 2019 compare to, to 2018? So you can look up there and you can see in the slide. You, so let me just go over the colors. If I think I, I'm understanding your question. So if you look at the top, you'll see the blue is for the 2017 mm -hmm. MCAS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can see how each, how the progress that each one of the subgroups made from starting back in 2017. I put three years of data up there. So your, to your question, it depends on the grade level um, it depends on the grade level. The, I, I didn't see a trend, but the trend that I did see is that there is a gap between our African American students, our Hispanic and Latinx students, and all students and our white students. So when you look at the various subgroups, and then, you, and then the next slide you'll see where I broke it down between economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, EL students, high needs, and EL and former ELL students. EL students, there's a gap. So that is the trend that's going from slide to slide. Now, I did not go into the information in order to, you know, actually, I did not equate the, the, the gap that is there between, you know, 2018 and 2019 to see whether or not every, you know, what Understood. that discrepancy is. But that, that can be done. I it just would be interesting this, because the, the difference between all students and African-American students in 2018 was 40%. The difference in 2019 was 35%, right? Mm -hmm. That, to me, seems like good news. I mean, not great news, right, because we're still only at 38% for our African-American students. Correct. But the difference, the delta, changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's hard for me to see with these I can't, I can't, I have to do the mental math on the delta for each one of these. And so that's, um, that, that would be interesting to look at for each of these, um, these groups and then the subgroups in the next Sure, slide. absolutely. I mean, we want to take this data and we want to rip it apart and we want to look at every data point. So yes, you do bring up a very good point. Yes. The, the point you were making about gender before, I just quickly went ahead and looked at the math ones. It's not as broad at the lower levels. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and the other factor is, I don't know how many, I don't think we have very many male uh, elementary teachers uh, at the, the lower groups. But I mean, I didn't know if that was something to compare. It may be too something small to, to, to look at. I think, yeah. I think there is an identification issue that, that is a positive thing in presentation. Uh, male to male, female to female, mm -hmm. uh, and that's something we, you, you can't change. But the math did not seem to be as, as broad a uh, separation as the uh, thing. I saw it too. It's something we need to look at. Exactly, especially as we talk about diversifying our teaching force. We're not only looking at it from an ethnic and racial standpoint, viewpoint, but we're also looking at it from a gender yep. viewpoint. Like we want to have uh, our students to see people that look like them in front of the classroom. Right. And so it's, it's something to consider. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. Do you look at the gender breakdown in informational text versus literature? Because that tends to also sway on, on gender and uh, wondering if that was sort of, sort of what was really contributing strongly to the female performance versus the male performance. Yeah, we do have that data. I, I, I don't have it here to present, but we do have that. We can look at, like, as I said before, we look at the item analysis, and we look at the questions, and we look at the standards. And so that revolves around the, the information, um, the uh, fiction and nonfiction text. Yeah, I mean, there, there are instances where you've got classrooms that are spending you know, uh, a greater proportion 
portion of time on fiction versus nonfiction, and, and it teases out within the data. And if you see some real differences within the data coming from classrooms or grades, mm -hmm. it, it's an indicator that you do want to tweak the uh, the reading material that kids are, are getting in those Absolutely. grade levels. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That'd make a very good point. So. Uh, just overall, as I flip through the slides, uh, you will see a, a discrepancy, like, as I stated before, between our subgroups and all students and our white students. So when I went through and I looked and tried to observe the things that jumped out at me, that is something that jumped out at me, and that is a trend that has remained constant with each one of our grade levels. So each one of the slides uh, I've I've created a slide for race, ethnicity, and gender, and the other subgroups. Now, when you don't see uh, data for a particular subgroup, that just means that we didn't have enough students in that particular subgroup where the results were reported. So I'm going to jump to. Please just your race. Okay. So, Miss um, Morgan, when you asked about the performance over time. This slide, I think, uh, will communicate a little bit better about how all of our subgroups have performed over the last three years on the next generation MCAS. And you'll see how there's the, at the, and, and these are the scaled scores. So this is not the percentage of students that are meeting and exceeding, but these are the scaled scores. So you'll look at the average scaled score over time uh, in grades three through eight for ELA. And you'll see how the, each one of the ethnic and racial groups are represented. And you'll see that, again, as I stated before, the trend that we see is our Hispanic and our African American students are not performing at the same level as the other subgroups. So looking at 10th grade, I want to point out that uh, last year, as, as I stated before, that the 10th graders took the ELA uh, MCAS online, the next generation ELA MCAS online for the first time. So that's why you only see one year of data. And so we compared how we did to the state. So we're gonna use this uh, piece of data as benchmark. So we're gonna compare ourselves as we move forward, uh, as we look at how we're improving or not improving. And you'll see again that trend of African-American students and our Hispanic Latinx students um, when compared to all and our white males. And you'll see our female students at the 10th grade are still outperforming our males. Mm. And then this is the other subgroups. And you'll see, uh, but you will see in all of the categories, we did outperform the state. So looking at the growth percentiles, uh, this slide is very hard to see. Uh, so again, we're looking at our uh, grades three through eight ELA data. And just to, I know you can't really read the scores, but when you look at the moderate growth, you want to, uh, between 40 and 60, uh, percent is considered moderate. Anything below 40 percent is considered low growth. And then anything above 60 percent is considered high growth. So when we look at our subgroups uh, in, in grades three through eight, um, when you look at the uh, ethnic and racial groups, uh, you'll, you can't see it up there because it's very hard to read, but all the groups uh, had moderate growth, um, except, and, and our African American students, again, are showing, are at the lower end of this category. And so we need to continue to look at how we can impact their achievement and growth. So if they're moving at, a, at, a, at the same rate as the other subgroups. And then on this slide, uh, we're looking at the, um, economically disadvantaged for grades three through eight. Uh, and you'll see uh, 
on, on the left-hand side uh, is our 2018 growth uh, results, and on the right-hand hand side is the 2019. And so again, uh, for our non-economically disadvantaged and our economically disadvantaged, they both uh, had moderate growth uh, for both years. However, our economically disadvantaged students are at the, are at the lower end. And this slide is showing our students with disabilities when compared to students without disabilities and our non-disabled students with students with disabilities. And again, it's pretty much the same trend, scoring in moderate growth. And as I pointed out in my first presentation, we want to be on, on these quadrants, on these charts, we want to be in the upper right side because that's high growth, high achievement. Uh, and so that's where we want to continue to move. And this uh, slide again, moderate growth, but this is showing our EL, EL, EL student population when compared to the non-EL, moderate growth. This slide is showing our high needs and non-high needs. Again, moderate growth. and gender, which is moderate growth as well. And so the next slide is 10th grade, uh, economically disadvantaged. And again, all the, in, in all the subgroups, as we scroll through them, you'll see that we scored in moderate growth. And so that, that was pretty much the, the trend that we saw with the student growth percentiles for ELA uh, in all of our grades. So I'm going to pass it over, the mic over to Paula, and she's going to go over our math results. Good evening. Um, so I'm going to go through very similar slides. The data is slightly different um, for the math. So we have uh, the data by grade, but as Dr. McNeil pointed <coughs> out, you know, it really does fluctuate grade to grade. For some of these subgroups, the numbers are so small that you're going to see that um, variance at the grade level. So I'm going to jump ahead. It's there for your reference, but I'll jump ahead to the slide that has <coughs> the trend and scaled score. <clears throat> so this is grades three through eight combined. So now the numbers of kids we're talking about is bigger, a little more stable and we're looking at their scaled score over three years. Um, it's important to note the, the vertical axis over on the left, that's really zoomed in. The scale on MCAS goes from 440 up to 560, but in order to see those um, lines at the top, they were so clumped together, I just zoomed in, but it's important to note that this may make it look a little more drastic than it is because we've zoomed in. But as you can see, <clears throat> all of the groups except for the African-American group, have shown improvement over three years where the African-American group has dipped and then was sort of steady between those last two years. So the gap has, at this grade, for these grade levels, widened a little bit. So we're going to look at these slides here, which again are hard to read, and I think it's the big picture that we're looking at here. Um, so again, we have grades three through eight combined. And as Dr. McNeil said, we want to be in the top right corner. So when we look at this data by race ethnicity, our um, Asian students, multi-race students, um, and white students are those three bubbles up near the top. And you actually can see that they move over closer to that top right <coughs> corner. Whereas the African-American, the yellow bubble at the bottom, it's sort of staying the same. So everybody's growing, but because of that, those top three bubbles, they're growing further. So the gap is widening. Everybody's moving, but not quite at the same rate. If you look back at um, 2017, which if I had put that up here, this would be too small for anybody to see. But if you look at 2017, it really does fluctuate a little bit. So we're trying to sift out the just sort of normal fluctuation from what's actually happening. 
and it can be hard to do even with just three years of data, especially with such small numbers for some of these subgroups. Um, but I will say, in this case, the gap from the, the lowest subgroup to the top subgroup in 2018, that gap was 46 points. And then in 2019, it widened to 54 points. And as I go through the other subgroup comparisons, that's the one group where we see it widening from one year to the next. So the next group by economic status, it's hard to tell here, but the gap actually does narrow a little bit from 2018 to 2019. Again, both within that solid middle growth um, and the gap narrows. Uh, by disability status, this narrows slightly from 48 points to, four, sorry, 48 points to 46 points, so really slight narrowing. Um, and this is actually still at 46 points, one of the widest gaps we see after that racial gap that we saw on the first slide. And by high need status, which again, it combines the students with disabilities or, or economically disadvantaged or EL students, if there are any of those, are in the high needs category. Um, and this gap narrowed by five points from about 43 points to 48, sorry, 43 to 38 points. So the gap's narrowing there. And our English learner status, <clears throat> again, the gap narrows from 40 points to 34 points. So for all of these, we're seeing that gap narrowing, except for that first slide that we saw by race, ethnicity. Questions? Yeah, I'm just curious. The growth seems almost consistent. Is there, do you, I assume you look at the cohort themselves uh, to see if there, if there is a, a difference. In other words, from one year to the next, that a particular cohort may have a little bit more going for them than the other ones. The, what I've seen is the consistent growth each year. <clears throat> Not to take anything away from the school or the, or the staff or anything, but the, could it be that cohort itself? Well, this is solid growth. And I think when you get down to individual cohorts, so by grade level, the numbers of students get to be so small that you see much more fluctuation, but okay. not a particular, that I've seen a particular cohort over time, just that you start to get in a little more of the, the noise, the Great. statistical noise. Thank you. Mrs. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to comment on, maybe it's not appropriate yet. No. Uh, so, uh, so when I look at this, what, what is sort of, worrisome is that we are a high achieving district and we're used to performing better than the state, right? And that for African American students, especially in math it seems, we're not performing better than the state. And for a district that prides itself on sort of doing things right, we're not. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and so, and, and seems to be a special problem in math and in science as well. Um, and so I think we have to think about what we need in terms of resources, intention, stuff like that. Um, you know, it does seem to be an issue in English, but it seems to get a little bit better, you know, after third grade. So, but math feels like, you know, a real issue here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Thelman. Could you just maybe talk a little bit about when the, when the faculty and staff see the scores for African-American students, what the, what the conversation is about and kind of what the conversation, because this is about three years, Trent, three or th uh, three years now. What are you guys kind of saying internally about how you plan to think about this or address this? Well, that's a very good question. Um, so I think that that's where we have to get into what we're doing in order to educate staff about culturally, culturally responsive instruction and looking at um, how we are uh, reflecting on our own implicit bias, uh, looking at our curriculum. Uh, we did write a, I did write an AEF grant uh, this year, and uh, they fund, they're, they're going to fund us to get to have an equity audit of our curriculum and instructional materials to see how and where we need to improve in that area. And I think that that's one of the things that uh, teachers are asking for as well is, is now that I've reflected on my implicit bias, what type of tools do I have in my repertoire of skills to address this issue? And so we really need to look at instruction. 
and, and delve into discussions about how we're meeting the needs of all of our students. So this has definitely sparked more conversations. I've had plenty of conversations with Dr. Bodie, all of my colleagues about what we can do in order to increase our knowledge about um, teaching African-American students. Yeah, because it struck me, it was interesting to see the trend for Latinos, the, the, the line was going up, mm -hmm. but the, the one for African-Americans went down slightly, and, or stayed the same, went down slightly, so that's sort of a, mm -hmm. I don't know, I, mean, I, I don't know, I'm not in the room with you guys making these decisions, but somehow something's clicked with the Latin American student population, or at least there's been some noticeable gains, so maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a possibility to study what went right there, or think about what went right there. Well, one thing I think that we need to do is that we have to do a better job of actually collecting qualitative data from our students yeah. to understand what their experiences are. Yeah. And there are different types of data that we have been looking at from the state um, that has allowed us to do that. And we need to just be more comprehensive in, in talking to them about their accumulated educational experience here in Arlington, starting all the way back when they're in kindergarten, yeah. and giving them a voice to tell us, this is what we need. And I, and I think that that is something that we need to continue to, to improve upon. Yeah. And I think that data will also lead us to helping us to understand how we can reach our African-American students. And not just our African-American students, but our African-American families, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So we, we need to be more engaging with our families from different populations. And we need to, because we need to get them into the um, conversation as well so that we can develop partnerships. One last thing, I, I don't, I don't I'm, I'm, I'm just speculating, so don't take us, I, I mean, I, I wonder sometimes when I, when I ever see a, whenever I see a trend like that in any um, group, uh, if, you know, uh, I, I, you know, to what degree uh, the, the number of IEPs, special education data, that's mm -hmm. sort of how that influences that, and I don't know. Absolutely. I don't know what to make of that. I don't have enough information to even react to it. But I, that's the question I would ask if I were in these meetings. Absolutely. You know, how many students are on IEPs? Um, uh, how many students are not getting the services uh, who, who maybe should have earlier on in their educational journey? I don't know. But that's kind of the, the, the it seems to me that's kind of like what you probe as you yeah. see. So when that. I see a trend like this, I think that that leads me to believe that we need to look at our tier one instruction. Yeah. And we talk a lot about interventions and tier two and tier three <laughs> instruction or tier two and tier three interventions. But I think that we have to have a better focus on our tier one instruction, because that's when you see a trend. Yeah. When you see a trend, and you see students that are being referred to special education at a higher rate for a particular subgroup. That means that we're not doing something at the tier one you know, level. And so there's things that, just today I went to a, a conference on leading with equity and access and looking at UDL, so Universal Design for Learning, and seeing how we can adopt those principles in our instruction. And it also goes to our core values, right? So if we, we need to take ownership for all of our students. And so we need to have that understanding and also build capacity with our general education teachers, right? And give them the skills that they need instead of saying like, oh, this student needs services. I'm going to send them over here. Yeah. But I need to be able to, as a person who has, who's in charge of professional development, see what types of professional development I need to provide for our teachers so they feel confident and have the skills that they need in order to reach those students. Yeah, so it's like looking at our tier one instruction and seeing, and seeing how we can improve upon that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it, is a very, it is very complex. And I don't it's mean to, I don't mean to, I don't mean to uh, you know, you can't boil this down to a, a tagline or something. It's, 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 it's very complex. Absolutely. It requires a lot of a analysis, a lot of reflection by faculty and staff, by people doing the work in the classroom with the kids, mm -hmm. with the actual practitioners. So, at a high level, I just wanted, I, I just kind of to get a flavor of what you guys are thinking about and talking about inside the faculty, so that helps. No, we've had conversations along those lines, and I thank yeah. you for bringing that up, because yeah. this is something that's there in the data. Yeah. We need to tease it out, and then we need to address it. Yeah. And we, we can't talk around it, we can't talk through it, we have to directly talk about how race is impacting our instruction. Yeah, and it is, it is complex. Mm -hmm. It is very complex. It is complex. It is no, there's no like quick, easy, one-word solution. I appreciate one phrase solution, yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. Ms. Morgan? Um, and I think tagging on to Jeff's point, I hope that, that you will look at with these, this sort of same cohort year to year and try and, and, and find some um, 
trends in in how those same groups behave school year to school year. Like I was doing some math here and it looks to me like in ELA, the achievement gap from the third grade cohort last year to the fourth grade cohort this year, African American students narrowed the gap, right? The gap narrowed third to fourth grade, it narrowed fourth to fifth grade, it narrowed fifth to sixth grade, and then seven, sixth to seventh grade, it, it blew up. It was third, it grew by the gap, so the difference mm -hmm. grew by like 13%, mm -hmm. right? So why did that happen? Was there something in that cohort? Are these small, like, are they small, you know, to your point, are they, are they just so small that like a couple of kids coming and going are gonna have a huge impact? That's possible. Um, but it seems to me like if we're gonna talk about an achievement gap, we want to display and talk about the data with when we're talking about that delta. Like I don't want I want to talk about the difference between all students and African American students. I don't want to talk about um, I, I want to compare those differences as opposed to compare the performance. Does that kind of make sense yes. a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Jesus? Um I just want to point out that uh, confidence in math, which is really important is basically established by third grade, right? So people are, kids are already thinking of themselves as math kids or not math kids, right? So it feels like the work has to be done in these early grades, similar to with reading, right? The, that, and, and math is this weird thing. It's one thing that people don't feel shame in saying that they don't, they're like, oh, I don't know how to do math, right? People don't say that about reading. They don't say, oh, I don't know how to read, right? They, but they do say that about math. They sort of already identify themselves as not math kids, and so I think this is the question is, why is that happening to kids in those early grades? Because that shows up by third grade. It's already there. Yeah. And I will say that we have, over the past few years, two or three years, we have adopted a new resource. Right. So Investigations 3.0. So, so to know I think helpful. that we yeah. are seeing some of the benefits of having that particular resource, mm -hmm. because it really looks at not only just coming up with the answer as you're you know, solving a math equation, but it's looking at how, right. like looking at the various strategies that students utilize, and then looking at um, how they're uh, displaying their thinking. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to look at not just coming up with one way <coughs> for solving a, a problem, but also looking at various ways, how can you think about this differently? Mm -hmm. And so that particular resource is that's why we selected it, because it's also aligned with the state standards. And so I just want to point that out, that that resource, the last um, grades that adopted that resource was last year, was fourth and fifth grade. And so now that we have it fully implemented in grades one through five, then we go back and see, okay, where do we need to go in and provide some supporting professional development, that job embedded. And then we also have math coaches that we've uh, employed over the last few years. So, and we have math interventionists. So I think that our math director, Matt Coleman, has done a great job of looking at this systemically. Mm -hmm. And now we just have to look at where we need to provide the support for teachers. Mm -hmm. And just one last comment for me. I just want to echo, you know, Mr. Thielman's thoughts. I mean, this is basically still new data, right? You've only had it for, this, this set of data is relatively new. You've only had it for about a month. <laughs> Right. I don't know how much you've communicated to, to the administrative team or or the faculty yet, mm -hmm. but I think the message, you know, for me, as chair of the school committee, is that this is something that is serious. Mm -hmm. the, the performance over African American students is is not improving, so it's something that we need to focus on as a team. There's a lot that you're doing, and I appreciate that, mm -hmm. but I think the message needs to be that you know it's not it's not listed specifically as one of our goals, but this is new data. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this new data, it's something that I think we all want to focus on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, and if I could just respond um, to Ms. Seuss's comments about, about math perceptions, and that's one of the things as an elementary <coughs> math team we talk a lot about, and we bring into our professional development with teachers, and every time we're meeting with teachers to really help people understand the importance not only of the curriculum, mm -hmm. but the way that we are implementing the curriculum and how that can either confirm someone's identity as a math person or not and really talk that up. And we've talked a lot with families um, about that and how math is taught probably differently than how they learned it in school. And 
So it's something that is definitely on the forefront, but we can always do more work in that area, and we keep working on it. And I think reaching out to families, it makes me also wonder about are we really reaching all families when we invite them into the schools and they can come in during the day, how many families can come in during the day and how many families that just doesn't work for. So the more we can think about that, as Dr. McNeil said, we just finished that three-year rollout of implementation, which is a great starting point, but we know there's still mm -hmm. a lot more work that we can be doing. Um, so just to finish up these slides, you can see the English learner status, I think I mentioned, did narrow. And then um, by gender, as someone pointed out earlier, we see the gap um, is, is much more narrow here than we saw in ELA in math, and in fact, it, it flipped. So I think um, in 2018, females were ahead by three points, and then in 2019, males were ahead by one point. My sense is maybe they're just going to hover right around each other, but I'm not sure, so we'll see. Um, and then we have the, the data at 10th grade. So at 10th grade, we have, again, you know, um, there's so few students there that um, had a growth score that we only see two bubbles on the race ethnicity on the graph, but if you could read the data underneath, which you can't, um, there's still a racial gap from the highest group, which is the white students at 84% median and exceeding to African American at 54%. So the gap there is 30 points, which is more narrow than what we saw at the elementary and middle school grades, um, but there is still a gap there. Um, same thing with the economic disadvantaged. And then again, the gap with the disability status, that's where we see one of the bigger gaps at grade 10 is between the, um, the disability status. and then the gender gap, a little closer. So looking at our science, technology, and engineering results, <laughs> again, I wanna point out that um, last year was the, well, not again, but the, the fifth graders took the online next generation uh, science, technology, and engineering MCAS. And so that's why you only see one year of data is because we're gonna use this as our benchmark. And as you can see, uh, in most of the cases, uh, we perform better than the state, uh, but looking at our African-American students and our Asian students in this respect, uh, they did not perform better than the state. And then this is our subgroup population, economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, EL, high needs, and EL and former ELs. We perform better than the state, but you see when compared to all students, uh, there is a gap. I'm looking at our eighth grade, uh, and all of the subgroups, except for our African-American students, uh, they uh, perform better than the state. And then looking at the other subgroups, uh, they outperform the state, but the trend is there where there, there's still a gap between their performance and all students. <coughs> so the reason why you see more data on this 10th grade slide is because the 10th grade uh, took the legacy MCAS, so we were able to compare uh, the 10th grade performance over the last three years. Uh, as you look at their performance, they either equaled or performed better than the state for all the subgroups. Uh, but when you look at their performance when compared to 2018, um, it, it was somewhat stagnant for our African American students um, and then if you look at the other grades, uh, you know, it, I'm, I'm sorry, the other subgroups, you'll see that uh, some subgroups did a little bit better and then some subgroups uh, did not. And looking at the subgroups, the other subgroups, you'll see that there was an improvement uh, from last year. And if you look over there at the EL and former ELs, uh, last year was the first year that we had uh, 
20 students, enough students, and even to even look at those results. But in all the subgroups, they did outperform the state, and they did show an improvement for all the results that were reported than last year. So just as you know, a few of you make comments, and I thank you for your comments, but some of the things that we are doing um, is, so two big things that we did last year. Uh, one, because of the override, we were able to uh, restructure our elementary schedule so that principals would have more time to meet with teachers on a weekly basis and also to provide grade level teams times that they can meet throughout the week with each other. And so one of the expectations and one of some of the feedback that I have received this year from our coaches, our literacy and math coaches, is that those meetings are being co-planned between the principals and the coaches and that they are looking at data and they are looking at the subgroup data and they're looking at student work. So they're, giving, they're, they're getting an opportunity to do the things that we want them to do on a regular basis. Uh, before, when we just had the early release Tuesdays, with, which, you know, they had common planning time every week, but it wasn't during the week. And I, and I look at this as being real time because you can, the coaches can come in there uh, into the school and that they can work with the teachers on a lesson and then they can go meet with the teacher during the common planning time uh, that they have to debrief about that lesson. So I think that this is gonna give us an opportunity to have that job embedded professional development that we've been pushing for and, uh, and, and improve the relationship between the coaches and the teachers, and so they can get an invitation into the classroom. Other things that we've done is we've implemented and improved our district-wide data bank. Last year we piloted it, and it's a tool that we use to collect all assessment data. So we have three years of assess, of, I'm sorry, three times a year we have, we collect formal assessment data at, K, uh, at the K through five level but we also have expanded those conversations to talk with the curriculum leaders about how this can also um, uh, be taken and expanded at the middle school level. Uh, and, and I've, able, and I've able, been able to have those conversations to have our curriculum leaders in other content areas to identify areas to identify various assessments that they would like to have uh, put into our data bank. And so the data bank will provide our teachers with th that assessment data it's very organized, and then they can look at trends as they compare the performance of individual students to the class, how their class compared to the district, right? So they'll, and, and the MCAS data is in there as well. So we have the local formal assessments that we give throughout the year, as well as our state assessment data. And we're looking to expand it and, and include behavior data as well. So we're looking to expand the use of the data bank at the secondary level and see what types of data we want to put in there. Uh, and, and that can include uh, progress report data, attendance data, so the sky's the limit. And the reason why we chose this particular um, platform is because it's, it's, we can customize it to our needs. And, I, and as I mentioned before, we're going to have uh, an assessment, an uh, equity audit, uh, which will assess our curriculum materials uh, for stereotyping, negative images of various uh, groups such as African Americans, Hispanics, uh, and, and also looking at all the social identifiers that our students might use to uh, uh, define themselves and make sure that, that, that they're represented in those curriculum materials. And yes. That audit that you just mentioned, will that include the libraries as well? Yes. Great. So all curriculum materials. And I've already had conversations with our, our we just, you know, we do have now a certified librarian. We've hired one. And uh, I met with her and Stacy Kitsis, who was the high school librarian. And we had a meeting. And we're talking about uh, now that we have uh, in our budget line items to purchase library materials. Uh, we're talking about how we can strategically utilize that, the, that funding to make sure that our collections are diversified right. and they're representative of the students that are in our, in our school and representative of the population out in society. So we're, we're trying to be very strategic with that funding. It's not a lot, but I think that we can definitely 
uh, make strides in, in providing more uh, equity as, as students check out books where they can see uh, main characters and authors that look like them. Questions? You know, one, one last, one, and then I'm going to drop this because I've exhausted. No, it's fine. But I, it, I, I, you know, um, it it occurs to me without being uh, without being in the room with you folks <clears throat> that you you might say, well, you you might say, and I, I'm I'm not saying this is a school committee uh, directive, but you might say, look, our goal in the next X year or two is to um, perform better than the state. Uh, have, have our African American students perform better in the state? Because I think an expectation of the town of Arlington is that our, our kids are going to outperform the state. <clears throat> it's sort of a, you know, an expectation, a hope, mm -hmm. a desire. And so maybe, maybe, maybe that's sort of okay. How do, what do we do? And so you just focus on that question. What do we do to make sure we outperform the state? Maybe that's too narrow. I, I know maybe that's too narrow of a question. But I just throw it out there as something you folks may want to bat around in a meeting. Is that is that, <clears throat> would that help guide our work? Would that help um, us think about more support that can be provided? Would it help us think about how we apply, you know, a greater rigor to some of these students? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know because I'm out of the room, but I just throw that out there as a maybe no, something. I, I, I appreciate that, but yeah. I think that, you know, I want to take you one better. Yeah, okay, I think good. that as we, as we look at our African-American students, not just performing well on the test, yeah, but we want to improve their educational experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to understand where are we not connecting? Yeah. Right. And, and we have to really look at this. And it is very complex because you're not just looking at what they're exposed to within the district. You're looking at the exposure, what they're exposed to out in society, you know, representations of themselves in the media. Right. And so it's it's very complex and it's it's entrenched in our society. And we just have to call it what it is. It's institutionalized racism. And it's been done over time. And so because of this, we have to not only combat what, you know, we have to be able to understand how we can combat that within the district and in our teaching practices. And so we have to understand and not make assumptions based upon the color of anyone's skin of what their goals are. What do they want to achieve? How can we enhance their experience? How can we get to know them as individuals? so that we can understand how they learn, because we can't clump them all into the same group. They're all individuals, just like anybody, anybody in this room. And we have to understand what drives them. Mm -hmm. And we have to have conversations with families and understand what the goals that parents want to ha they have for their, ch their children. So it, it's, it's very complex, it's gonna take time, and we have to be able to identify uh, ways to do this without blaming or shaming. And we talk about white privilege and we talk about all those things and how we can use that to our advantage and raise the awareness to understand that it's there. And so I think that that is very complex. I think our teachers work very hard and it's not a knock on them. But I think that we have to understand what we do well and the things that we need to do in order to enhance those things that we're already doing well and, may, and really look at what we're doing that's not so you know, that's not, that doesn't give us the results we're looking for and take those things and discard them and replace them with things that do work. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ms. Seuss? Uh, just two points. One is that MCAT scores are not a be all and end all. They're just a dip mm -hmm. stick, right? You know, just right. to see how we're doing. Um, so that having that as a goal can still be a goal. The hope is that underlying that is, you know, genuine progress. And the other thing is why it's so disturbing to see us perform worse than the state is that there's not more institutional racism in Arlington than there is in other communities across the state, right? Or more sort of, or, or fewer representation. Well, there might be. I mean, that's the thing you're looking at. There might be fewer representations Correct. in the in the absolutely. in the materials, and so that is absolutely something. But 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 certainly, uh, you know, other towns and communities are similar to Arlington. In the, in the sort of largest society. And that's why it's sort of um, concerning to look at why, what's going on in Arlington. Sure. And, and a lot of times this is just, oh, we haven't really reached out enough. You know, we haven't sort of identified um, problems early enough, right, when we saw somebody struggling. Um, and so, so just, I just want to make that point, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, 
that and I think that we have to understand how we're responding to students when they are struggling. Right. So what are exactly. the things that we're utilizing to for intervention? Right. And, right. We, and when is that happening? So you bring up a very good point. So like I said, it's like looking at the whole experience of our students and being able to enhance that. And so when they feel safe and secure, right, and Welcome. they feel like there's somebody there that's going to advocate for them, yep. then they're going to do better. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big connection there with the SEL, mm -hmm. you know, social and emotional learning. So we have to figure out how we can enhance those connections mm -hmm. and make sure that that's consistent across the district. Mm -hmm. Great. What else? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Hainer. He's going to share with us a little bit about his uh, Flags for the Heroes project from the Rotary Club, which you can see right outside our window and, uh, on the front lawn. I'm nervous. In eight and a half years, it's the first time I've sat here. <laughs> Bear with me. Uh, I want to thank uh, <coughs> the chair for allowing me to do this. Uh, if you may not have noticed, if you arrived here in the dark, the front field has uh, been transformed. Um, just want to share with you that the flags fly for a variety of heroes, the men and women who are serving or have served as members of the military, police officers, firefighters, first responders, parents, teachers, coaches, mentors, community leaders. Also for your best friend or the, anyone else. The group. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I, one of the, we put four up for military members of our family, and I put my wife up there. She's my best friend, and she's my hero. This morning at 9:30, this is what the front field looked like, just like that. One flag out there. We had the students from the workplace program. I want to commend them and their teachers, Mr. Lundstrom and his staff. They do a fantastic job. These young people have come out each year. We, uh, several of us, you'll see a picture of the Rotarians at the very end. Uh, we'd get about six or eight flags out in about 25 minutes or a half hour. These young people come out there and they put the other 153 out in half that time and they do a better job of it, real quick. And uh, they're, they're just phenomenal. Uh, putting the flags out, the, uh, us older ones were out finding the holes in the ground. Uh, this is an aerial shot that was taken last year uh, from it. There are 160 flags out there right now. On each flag, there's a card listing uh, the individual hero. Some of them uh, have a couple. Some have military, different experiences on them. Uh, these are the students in front of the school. Did a great job. And there's the old timers uh, that were out there. So we, uh, the, these flags will be out there from today through November 12th. And on November 3rd at 1 o'clock, we'll have a dedication out front. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Great. Thank you very much for your tireless efforts in organizing this at your opinion. All right. So now just a few minutes on the superintendent review, review process. Um, so today in Novus, uh, there is posted all of the uh, evidence for the superintendent goals and the district goals. Um, I still need to get to the evaluation form, which I will get to tomorrow. Um, What's the deadline? Uh, and I was thinking that the deadline would be uh, two weeks from tomorrow, so November 8th. Okay. Does that sound all right with everyone? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Could I ask you to just give us like a two or three day warning? Of course, yes. <laughs> sure, <right. laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Uh, and uh, that will give me time to assemble everything before our uh, next meeting, which is, actually three, which is actually not for three weeks. So the calendar benefits us um, this year. Mm -hmm. Did it work for mm -hmm. any questions? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Next is the budget calendar that's in Novus. Uh, I think we looked over it last time. Uh, You're using the motion to approve, that's it? Yes. So yeah, move, I think that's the idea. I move approval. Second. Mr. Hainer? Uh, just a, a question, and I apologize for not bringing it up the last time. Is there a reason <coughs> that we are going three weeks from, from November to the first one, to uh, December 12th? 
In other words, we, we, we're we doing back-to-back -back in November, and I understand the reason for that. Yeah. Why are we doing back-to-back -back in December? Is it because different people can't make meetings or something? You mean they hear from Well, we have so? December 12th and December 19th, mm -hmm. as opposed to coming in on December 5th. Uh, I don't know. I mean, when we set up the calendar... I apologize for bringing it up at the last minute. <laughs> uh, last year, so Thanksgiving is... I think we Thanksgiving's late. We I think when we did it originally yeah. a couple of years ago, the superintendent, there were other meetings the, that were taking place and interfered. Right. But I didn't know if that's the same as this year. It is. Thank you. Okay. I thought we're meeting. We're not meeting December fifth. We are not. We're meeting You're December twelfth and twelfth and nineteenth, according to this. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, if there are conflict meetings, there several years ago, Ed Cohen and I'm yeah, sorry, Ed Cohen and a couple of other conferences, so... And in November, we meet the, t the 14th and 21st. Okay. Yes. Yeah. How's your calendar? We'll pick it up later. 21st, I won't be there. Calendar. I get it, I get it. Uh, yes. I mean, we can consider whether we need the 21st, but I think we likely do mm -hmm. as of now. So. All right. Any other discussion on the calendar? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed or abstentions? Nope. Unanimous. Thank you. The financial report, Mr. Mason. Good evening. Excuse me. Um, so tonight you'll have your funny of your monthly reports. Um, well, this will be the first one for this fiscal year. Um, this is a report through September 30th, 2019. Um, and it's still the same format. It's not, an, it's, un, it's not changed. There are three reports included. Um, as you're aware, there is one for the general fund, the town appropriation, which is um, what the town provides to the schools and with state aid. Uh, the general fund figures, uh, what you will see is that the revised budget or the original budget has, is adjusted from what is what was, what was proposed in our earlier superintendent's budgets because it includes uh, the override amounts and the FinCom change in formula that was proposed to the town at town meeting. <coughs> um, in this report, you'll also, so the, the this report, you'll notice that uh, at this moment, we've, t it's at September 30th, we spend about a total of $7 million in actual expenditures and another $7 million was encumbered. The, those uh, encumbrances uh, do not include salaries. Those salaries were encumbered in October. So in the October report, you will see that. But the projected expenses include those encumbrances because we knew at that time. And we've reconciled salaries. And um, that leaves us with this projected balance of about 445000 But there are... Um, We've hired many positions, but there's still some positions that still need to be hired, so the funding will be provided in that balance to, to cover those positions. Um, also in this report, you, got, you will have your grant report, which includes the state and federal grants. All grants and federal grants and uh, state grants are being spent according to plan. Uh, we will draw down revenue uh, periodically through the year as expenditures hit. Uh, they do show that they have their first initial draws um, from grant award. <coughs> um, the final report is revolving funds and as well as we are collecting revenue and spending according to plan. Um, I just want to note that uh, we completed this report recently um, and our new uh, school accountant who's on board okay. helped, pre uh, helped prepare this. Uh, it was his first time around so it was some work but it he did a great job. Okay. Any questions? Great. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask if we were able to hire a school accountant. <laughs> yes. So that's, yes. that's good news. Yes. Uh, is he have some experience or would? Uh, he has experience in private sector. Okay. Um, a lot of um, investment banking. Yep. Um, when we went through the recruitment process, what we thought about him was that he was very able to communicate clearly. Um, he had a lot of project experiences, um, very technic technologically savvy, mm -hmm. um, and he had a lot of customer support background. Was He was doing client support. He was a senior client uh, associate at his previous uh, employer. 
Uh, so we felt that he was the best candidate for the job. Great, thanks. Mr. Hainer. Uh, a couple of questions on line item 81203, substitute teacher, day to day. Uh, you're projecting $42,000 deficit. Am I reading that correct? Let's see, 81203. Substitute teacher. Give me teacher. one second. I don't, I'm just, my computer's freezing. Um, substitute 81203. You're saying we're rejecting the deficit? I'm, well, I'm, re rejecting? I'm going over to the last column, mm -hmm. and it said it available budget, and it's in parentheses. So yes, okay. yeah. So I'm just that's something that happens every year. Is it because we do not put enough money in the? <clears throat> this is a consistent thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's happening, <clears throat> and I, I just ask going forward, Superintendent, everybody. Mm -hmm. We have trouble getting subs, I understand that. We don't pay a lot for our subs, I understand that, but at the same time. And then the next one down there, the next line, extended term sub substitute teacher, I assume that's rather large, 97,000. Is that because we have special needs or something that we weren't anticipating that happens? I, I can understand that might happen. So the, the, the answer, I don't mean to interrupt you, um, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, but the, the extended term sub line, there are some positions that were budgeted previously in there, so, but then there are, what we're using is, um, in the projected expenses, is how to, what we spent last year. So we, there's, it's hard to kind of project the other long-term substitutes that may cover for a FMLA from a teacher being pregnant or whatnot, so. I understand, I understand that one, but the regular day-to-day -day sub, mm -hmm. we've always showed a negative number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all, all I'm suggesting going forward, yes. that, that we might want to make that a little bit bigger. Down at the bottom of that page on uh, longevity, I'd like to commend you. Uh, you've you've got, just about got that totally under control, uh, the big one. I'm just curious, under the <coughs> longevity for custodians, I thought custodians belong to the town and not us. So the custodians are, we fund the custodian budget. We fund any, any of the facility staff that's on, in our okay. buildings. Based on that, $14,000, did a lot of people resign and we got new staff? That's why we have a, a positive number there? Um, we, so we don't encumber the longevity and we haven't clearly projected that, so I will look into that figure. Okay. Well, when I made the statement before, and I, I apologize if it came off sarcastic, the longevity under administration and, and clerical used to be much bigger, mm -hmm. and I brought, I brought it to your attention last year, and it, you've narrowed right on top of it. And I, I mean, I'm sincere about commending you on that. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Seuss? Uh, so I actually had, I did have the same question about um, subs, but mm -hmm. I think um, Mr. Hanner covered it well. Um, I'm curious about this custodial snow ice removal. So, so it seems I knew like, that was a good question that was come know, up. The projected expenses are four times the original budget amount. The original budget amount looks way too low. So custodial snow ice removal. So yes. once again, these are based on expenses from last year. Um, so the projection is based on what we spent last year. Yes, correct. But the budget is so not the but yeah the budget it was uh, uh, based on an average. Oh. Of the, the 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 data that was known when we would, when we so we have the, spent much less in some years. Correct. Oh, so it was based on the previous budgets that was known in expenditures at the time when we created the budget. So we'll make adjustments to this and uh, reallocate the the dollars based on where the, they're going to be spent when, it, when it's time. Obviously, it's still early. And actually, I thought you were going to ask me a different question okay. on that because there are expenditures in that line which are, were actually inappropriately placed. Oh. So we are reclassifying them. Um, they will, they are, it's already been completed, but it will be reflected in the next month's report. Sorry, which, where, which is reclassified? It's showing that the, the, same, the same line. Already? The same line that you just yeah, you yeah. inquired oh, about. Oh, I see. Oh, the $1,000 you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. No, yeah. I was just curious that the expected expenses were four times our budget, so that's not. A um, couple more things. Yep. Um, it seems like we're spending a lot of money on instructional materials and on textbooks, which I think is great that we hadn't originally planned to do. 
um, us a training education conference attendants. Is that some of that money something that stuff that could come out of um, some revolving funds that might have a little buffer in them rather than out of the regular budget? Um, so those are one-time expenses. Those are great uses for those those funds. Yes, we'll look we'll look into that. I think that was it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Ms. Morgan. Um, on the snow and ice, just to beat it mm -hmm. to death, mm -hmm. I, didn't we didn't we procure some kind of a truck or something? Didn't we do something so mm -hmm. that we took on more of our snow and ice removal? Or am I like remembering so that could we see some of that shift into our custodial? So what will, since we did procure another truck this year, See? Uh, that was a plow, um, mm -hmm. we will, it will take upon more salaries to people that actually man the, the equipment, but uh, we'll see a reduction in contracted services. Got it. And the contracted so, services come out of snow and ice. Yes. It's a Got different, it's a different, a different snow removal contracted. It's a different line. So oh, you're cool. just basically seeing a shift in that, yeah, but it, yeah. obviously at a, at a much lower rate. Thank you. Doing it internally, yes. All right, um, my turn. The, so I'm confused about the difference between the, the original budget and the revised budget. Mm -hmm. It's the same, it's actually the same total amount. So that, it doesn't reflect the override money change. Um, There's only a $1,000 transfer, so um, the, so is, is, this, is this because you really haven't reallocated money yet and you're planning to, or why are there two different columns when they're almost identical? Good question. So I didn't change the format of the report. Mm -hmm. um, and so in your previous reports, those two columns were there. And those basically identify any transfers that are made in between object codes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, example, if we need to transfer between snow overtime, snow ice removal overtime to snow ice contractor services or vice versa, you would see it in that transfers columns and then that would update the revised budget. But since the override and um, is part of the budget, that is the original budget. So if you were to go back, and I don't remember the, the first number off the top of my head, I should have came prepared with that, um, but that, that dollar amount was not $71.4 million for your right, total budget. Right. Yeah. So that number, the override, and any other adjustments are included in that total budget amount. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's two different ways to do this. I mean, you could just eliminate the transfers in a revised budget column because it's not showing anything. Or you could start saying, sitting down now that we're a full quarter into the year and saying, well, natural gas is going to be higher, so I need to move some money into natural gas, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. um, is that what you're planning to do, or? So that's what that transfer columns represents. Yeah. So if in case that it's to be more transparent right, as right. we move things. So if, yeah. I, if, if we were to remove the original budget and transfer column, mm -hmm. it may be difficult, unless you're really sharp and remember every single number, to remember what was the previous report in that budget column versus yeah. the current report. So. Okay, think, so, you're, so gonna, you're going to transfer money as the year goes on. Mm -hmm. Correct, okay. correct. So to in, like, as you have these questions about certain deficits, we mm -hmm. will look at different objects to move funding from to and from to actually align with how spending is actually <clears throat> going to go. Okay, great. Thanks. Anything else? All right, thank you. And now we're on to the superintendent's report. I actually don't have... Um, a lot tonight. Uh, I do want to mention that I put this report mm -hmm. on your desk. That's great. Your seats. Just received mm -hmm. it today. This is not certified numbers. Yep. You, have to, you need to know that. But it does give you an idea of where we are. And as we talked about earlier in the year, we are a district that is over 6,000 students. And um, we, can, we expect that 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 trend will continue. One of the things that um, Mr. Macy and I have talked about is, you know, certainly updating our own projections within district, which we will do once we have the certified numbers. Um, not, not sure it really makes much sense to do it before then, because you have to do it twice. But then we're also looking at still, and we, we can talk um, with you about that, is get, uh, hiring someone to do 
um, some kind of a di projection at this point. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Mason has done a lot of research in terms of the vendors, and we'll see mm -hmm. what we're going to what we're going to propose to you. Um, but I think that we do need to have that as we go as we go forward in trying to plan. Um, the second thing is um, the high school, and I think that that's something that'll be it's always a a, uh, a topic. We are at this point doing a lot of uh, small group meetings. Uh, the architects have been here on a regular basis several days a week. We have transition meetings. We have meetings with curriculum leaders, with the administration, because there's a lot of, it, there's, uh, there's a focus on both the interior design and tweaking different things. And there's also, of course, the exterior. Uh, the building committee is going through a process, or will be going through a process, really has and that not really totally started yet, in which uh, is required by MSBA to take a look at, uh, you know, reconciliation of way we could have different savings uh, versus the budget because the op we are we are have a vote, we have a budget, and we're going to stick within that budget. But even as we go along through the process, there are some costs that have increased, just even the last couple months, and so. How does that reconcile with where we are? And so there will be uh, a lot of discussion about this once we get the next set of estimates in, which will be mid-November. The committee is going to be meeting quite a few times in, in November. Um, we are ready for another community forum, and we have one scheduled. Uh, notice of that has gone out. We'll continue to remind people that on November 30th, not Halloween, the night October, <laughs> October 30th, uh, which is next week, we're going to have a community forum at Town Hall from 7 to 8.30. What is, um, we, we plan to have the architect there talking about where we are with the design, but I think that this, this is what makes this forum more unique is that we now have for the first time um, Consigli construction firm that will be presenting and we'll be talking about um, the phasing of the project and asking questions, answering questions about that. So it's a great opportunity to get an update um, on where we are with the project. And after October 30th, perhaps at one of our meetings in one of the two meetings in November, we could um, have a little bit more in-depth look at some of some of the information we have at this point. Because there's people who won't be able to be there, but they may be listening at a school committee meeting. And uh, so we'll, we'll look at some of those des design changes. Mr. Hanner? Uh, last Saturday night, I uh, went with my wife for her 55th reunion, Arlington High School reunion. And the most consistent <laughs> talk was uh, how happy these people were. And they're from all over the country right now, from California down south and everything, constantly looking online and uh, the virtual tour and the things of that nature. And they're yeah. very, very impressed more so than I think you guys deserve, but uh, no, they, no, no, they, they, no, no, they that visual really tour is amazing. With it. And I kept, I finally, to, to quiet them down, I said, well, look, uh, let's plan on the uh, 60th reunion in the new high school. So you got to have it done uh, in five years. <clears throat> I thought it was the 50th reunion. 55th. Oh, 55th. Oh, okay. Class of 64. Okay. Um, I have here, and it's in my notes. Um, last thing is the update on athletics because we have there it is. All right. Um, our athletic program is doing very well, and um, Mr. Bowler gave me some updates, which I think is um, I'd like to share with all of you. Because we have um, some firsts this year in terms of qualifying for, for postseason, field hockey has qualified the first time since 2009. Golf has qualified for the first time since 2015. And boys soccer has qualified now for the sixth consecutive year, and girls soccer for the ninth consecutive year. In fact, I, I saw one of our soccer, girls soccer players earlier this morning, we were talking about the season, and um, 
Oh, she said, oh, we qualified a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Um, so the boys, girls, cross country, girls swimming and cheerleading will be competing in their Middlesex League meets next week. And um, the boys, girls, cross country and girls swimming will be competing in sectional and state meets in the next couple of weeks. So they're doing quite well. As, so congratulations to all these students. We're very proud of you and uh, good luck in postseason. On to the consent agenda. The following items are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant for approval, warrant number 20070, dated 10-15-2019, total warrant amount 2648660.21. Minutes for approval, regular school committee meeting, September 26, 2019, and October 10th, 2019. Have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Any opposed or abstentions? Unanimous. All right, subcommittee and liaison reports. Uh, Kirsty is not here. Policies and procedures. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, we met yesterday. Uh, we discussed meeting agenda uh, and we uh, also discussed some of the uh, items brought forth by uh, Dr. Seuss. Uh, one of the things we're going to be proposing is, and you get minutes in a, a full report of the recommendations and where we're going to go. Some of the things we're going to discuss again later. But one of the things we will be recommending is to uh, change the policy on meetings to go from 20 to 19 scheduled meetings per year, as that would seem to be easier for us to plan, mm -hmm. uh, noting that we can add and delete meetings during the year. But as a rule, to get to 19 seems to be where we want to be. We tend mm -hmm. to struggle to count, put, it, put the 20th on the calendar. Great. All right. Uh, curriculum instruction assessment and accountability. We met uh, today. We went over uh, the superintendent's two of her uh, goals for the 2018. Oh, now I'm going to get this wrong. For the 19. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's catchy. <laughs> it's catchy. It's it's like in there for the 1920 school year, um, and we uh, plan to bring those to the full committee for the next meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, community relations, Ms. Seuss. Uh, yes, we have a meeting scheduled November 6th, uh, focused on after school, and we're going to have um, in-house in programs come, come to see us. Great. Uh, facilities. Uh, the subcommittee will be presenting to the Hardy PTO on November 6th and the Pierce PTO on November 13th. Uh, what has gone on, what is going on, and what is planned to happen in their schools. Great, thank you. Uh, legal services. Nothing, nothing at this time. Building committee, anything else to add? Nope. All right. Calendar committee. The doodle hasn't gone out yet. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, election modernization committee, also Ms. Seuss. Uh, yes, I was there on Tuesday, um, had some lively discussions. Uh, the focus was on crafting questions to ask um, during, for Envision Arlington survey about um, accessibility and access and interest in elections. Great. Superintendent search process. Mr. Shipman. Uh, we'll meet next Monday. Great. Any liaison reports or announcements? Nope. All right. <laughs> Future agenda items. <laughs> Mr. Hainer. Uh, I don't know the correct procedure, but uh, what the person brought at the opening meeting, uh, whether the superintendent or take it to the coach to find out uh, the CFO, uh, what it would cost to have an, an additional sport added to the, uh, some sort of communication on that going forward. It's, yes. it's been being, it's okay. being discussed. Yeah. Oh, so she, she asked for it to be put on a future agenda. Right, so yes. So when it's, I'm making the official <laughs> request. Yeah, so hopefully before the budget development meetings, we'll be, you'll be able to present or have uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. the athletic director or Mr. Jango, whoever you want to come back and, mm -hmm. or, or send us some information any, any way. 
for first. Okay. Anything else? All right. Uh, so now we have executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union or non-union personnel in which if had held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in a meeting, open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. Uh, principles contract discussion. I have a motion to go into executive session. So move. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, roll call, Mr. Hayner. Aye. Ms. Seuss? Yes. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Schuckman? Yes. Yes. And I'm also yes. All right. Mm -hmm.